Okay, here we come. I warned people also that I don't believe in rewarding people for being late. Uh, I like to use the Admiral Reason uh, 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 way of doing things. When he was a board chair, he would tell us, when my butt hits the chair, the first slide goes up. <laughs> Yeah, you're not five minutes early, you're late. <laughs> Time tied formation. Yeah, amazing how those things go out the window once you take off the uniform. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Now, Al I can hear you, but you're a little bit muted. So I don't know if you can speak closer to the microphone or, or what the deal is. I, I think, you know, I'm just a soft-spoken person. What about now? That's better. Okay. I was gonna say, use your chief engineer voice. You know, you're trying to communicate with somebody over the sound of the diesel engines and this other thing and shipmate, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The other thing I've noticed uh, throughout our uh, symposium is that the numbers grow as the event rolls as a session rolls on, you know, I, I guess people feel they can come in anytime to a virtual event. You know, <laughs> it's easier to sneak in the back door, you know, without, you know, uh, embarrassing yourself than we do it for a live event. We do uh, webinars on a pretty regular basis and it's, it's interesting to watch how many people are registered, how many people show up, but how many people leave over the course of your webinar? That also is a telling sign. And uh, we had this <laughs> one guy giving a presentation where he had, he was reading one screen that was 90 degrees from the one that the camera pointing at him. So it kind of looked like he was talking off into the sunset <laughs> and, his, and his grandkids or something. And I mean, people completely lost interest because he wasn't paying attention to the camera and talking into it. And people were just migrating out of the room and, and it went from like 100% capacity at the beginning and it was at 20% in 10 minutes because everybody just left because they were looking at the profile view of this guy. And it was just like, he's not talking to us. So I don't, I don't feel like you're connecting with me. So they left. And I had to give him a critique afterwards. I was like, hey, you, the things you said were remarkable, but guess what? Nobody heard them because of your visual presentation. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot to be learned with going virtual and how to how to do this properly and not. Because <laughs> people will walk with their feet. Right. Out your session. That's right. We well, see our numbers are building up here steadily. Um, but like I said, I'm going to start at the top of the hour. And uh, they may miss my preamble, which is fine. Because the main thing I want them to hear is from, from you all. And good evening, everyone. Sinclair Harris here, president of the National Naval Officers Association, and welcome to our first senior executive panel that I recall having with the National Naval Officers Association. We've got a great set of panelists here um, that I will introduce in, in a minute, uh, but I wanted to start by, by just reminding folks why we're having this uh, special session. So Sinclair Harris did six tours in Washington, D.C. 
five in the Pentagon, three on the Navy staff, two on the Joint Stacks. And what I learned was that the network that I needed to build to be successful um, strongly depended on the government civilians who I was fortunate enough to work with. Ken Miller uh, just passed away um, a day ago. And, and many of us remember him with incredible admiration. He was a gentleman. He was wise beyond words. He was always kind to me and I think to many, many others. And, and I just would like to take a moment of, of silence, quite frankly, uh, to remember uh, Ken Miller. Thank you. So there was Ken Miller, Janice Haith, Vic Gavin, Ann Sandell, Stephanie Easter, uh, Pat Tamburino, who hired me at where I'm working right now at LMI, uh, Andre Brower, Andrea Brower, Sharon Smoot, Karen Burroughs, Joan Jones, Trip Barber, Robin Beal, Chuck Rashado, and the list goes on and on and on. These were part of the network that uh, Commander, then Captain, and on up Harris was able to leverage, was able to reach out to, who helped me to be successful during my career. And, and I, I, it has occurred to me that many of our young officers don't realize that until they come to headquarters, until they come to DC until they have a chance to uh, have a similar experience and they need to. You know, DOD civilians have supported the military since the Revolutionary War. Uh, during World War II, they provided medical and logistic support primarily. And today there are over 700,000 uh, uh, civilians in DOD. We're not gonna talk to all 700,000, but I got a great set here. We've got Miss Karen uh, Davis. Now you've got her bio, I won't read it to you, but she's the Director for Service Warfare in OSD, Acquisition and Sustainment Platform and Weapon Systems. She's been the Executive Director at the JSOC, PE, Executive Director at PEO Unmanned uh, Systems and Small Combatants, and various other positions in uh, the Warfare Centers. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got... Okay. We've got uh, Michelle Godfrey, Director of Civilian HR, Human Resources, Diversity Leadership, United States Coast Guard. She's also done the HR Director job at NASA, but her, her heart and most of her career is with the United States Coast Guard. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate it. We've got my shipmate, Al Curry. Deputy Assistant Commandant for Engineering and Logistics for the United States Coast Guard. He's been a Deputy PM uh, for Coast Guard for C4ISR. In fact, uh, Al, I thought you told me that the Coast Guard couldn't pay for all four Cs, only for three of them. But uh, he has uh, been in charge of a lot of important programs. Uh, and before that, he was a sailor, working engineering tours, EXO on the Nicholson, and CEO of uh, the Pensacola LSD 38, which really prepared him to be doing uh, the work he's doing for the Coast Guard because the ships are about the same age. Finally, last but not least, a shipmate Jimmy Smith, director of the Department of the Navy Small Business. And by small, we're not talking about a little bit of money, we're talking about a lot of money. Um, he's also been the DASN for Expeditionary and Logistics. And uh, he's also done the work uh, in SSP uh, as uh, Director for Integrated uh, Nuclear Weapons. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna ask each of you uh, in order, and I'll start with you, Jimmy, uh, to tell us a little bit about your experiences as a government civilian and working with your military counterparts. Absolutely, I do appreciate that, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I'm probably one of those very few Navy civilians that had a pretty unique experience with a military officer very early in my career. And I will tell you very early means 
one year out of college, I started working for what is now the Virginia class submarine program. And he was Commander Sullivan at the time, uh, retired uh, Vice Admiral Paul E. Sullivan is the person that I'm speaking about. But I was his only subordinate back some 28, 29 years ago. And he instilled upon me the submarine force. And he did so far as to teach me everything there was to know about a submarine. I mean, my workday started two hours in advance of my actual workday starting where he sat down with me and did school of the boat. And for two hours every morning, I would go through engineering drawings, engineering diagrams for all 256 ship systems and major components. And I had to know these systems inside and out. And it was down to the level of every valve number, every pipe number, every motor, every accumulator, everything has its own unique identifier and I had to know it personally. And at any given time over the course of the workday, he would say, Jimmy, get up in the, on the board and uh, draw the high pressure air system for the 688 first flight class submarine. And, you know, I was always working on something important, I thought, but I would have to stop what I was doing, get up on the board and draw out that diagram. And, you know, 30 minutes later, I'm done. And he's like, yeah, it looks right. Erase it. Draw the high pressure air system now. And this level of torture went on for quite some time until he upped the game on me one day. And he said, uh, here's a qual card. I need you to go, uh, go get this signed off. And I was like, qual card? What's a qual card? And he was like, well, the chief of the boat needs to sign off on your qual card. And I was like, well, what office is the chief of the boat in? I, I've never heard of this person. He was like, oh, he's, he's actually on the submarine. And I was like, what are you talking about? I, I wear a suit to work every day riding a submarine. That's not in my, no, what are you talking about? And uh, literally three days later, I was down in Norfolk on my first submarine with a qual card to get checked out and didn't even know how long the mission was that we were leaving on. And he gave me this little sea bag to go to sea with. And I thought three days was about a maximum of what I packed for. We were gone for 22 days <laughs> and I made good use of the one and only washing machine and one and only dryer on that boat. But that particular first ride turned into 16 different rides underway on various different classes of submarines. And it's not just to get a ride. It was to gain the experience of the operational force. And this man literally taught me he did so much beyond mentoring me. He sponsored me and he continues to sponsor me to this day. So I've had a very unique experience with military officers and caught him when he was young. He caught me when I was young. And over the time of him getting promoted, me getting promoted, he always made sure my name was in the mix for opportunities. And my name would have never been in play if he wasn't involved or behind the scenes. And opportunities came along to be the Virginia class construction manager when we delivered the first one. And it was him who said, Jimmy's ready for this opportunity. And people showed up in my cube and said, hey, tomorrow you're going to be the construction manager. I was like, well, wait a second. I'm the test and evaluation manager for a program that doesn't have a ship. You know, T&E kind of stood for travel and entertainment at the time. So uh, I uh, begrudgingly, you know, I said, well, why are you picking on me to be the construction manager? And he said, Sully said, you're ready. And all of the fighting stopped and I was ready and working with naval reactors, working with EB and Newport News to go about finishing the construction on that first boat and getting it out to sea and underway on Alpha Trials, the most proudest time of my life. But without that hands-on touch from that man, it would have never been possible. So I'll stop there and, uh, and yield some time to my colleagues because I can go on and on about Vice Admiral Paul. So. <laughs> you know, when you were talking, it reminded me when I was going through my qualifications, okay, Sinclair, you are a drop of seawater. Take me through the X, Y, or <laughs> Or you are a drop of air. Take me through this. At uh... Been there, done it, and did it for three different classes of submarines. So you guys earned those dolphins for doing it once. I did it for three different classes of submarines. Now, it's kind of the same once you go from boat to boat to boat. But, you know, I love the little gold dolphin y'all wear, but I think I need one made of platinum or uranium or plutonium or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've got an EL letter for gas turbine, steam, diesel, and uh, a junior EL for nuclear. So uh, believe me, I understand what you're saying. And, and understand that's not mentoring or training. That's coaching. 
Yeah. And coaches prepare the player for the game. Absolutely. Now, we're going to shift gears and go to somebody who knows even more about the, the real Navy, and that's Karen Davis, because Karen, you're working for surface ships. And look, when people think about the real Navy, it's ships, right, Karen? It definitely is. And uh, boats are our friends, but ships are where it is. So please tell us a little bit about your experience uh, working with uniform folks and and your your time as a uh, SES. I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn my camera off sync because I just heard something that just made my stomach hurt. But uh, I'm, <laughs> I'll, I'll let y'all go on with her. <laughs> um, so I'll start by saying that um, my career with the Navy right now spans uh, 32 years. And uh, I started out... Um, when the Aegis weapons system, and I know you're familiar with it, was in uh, its infancy. So, uh, and I, when I say that, that probably those of you who are familiar with the surface Navy knows that back in uh, the time of the Aegis weapons system, uh, Norton Sound and, and uh, Ticonderoga, those days, those ships were not uh, modified for women at sea. And so in order to gain proficiency though, you have to be at sea. So in my early career, I made it my business that any time a ship uh, 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 event occurred where they needed a tech rep, uh, in particular with the Aegis weapon system being so new, often the civilian engineers knew more about it than uh, the sailor because it was a brand new system. And so it was a lot of very aggressive and uh, deliberate uh, transfer of knowledge occurring at that time. Uh, so I made it my business to be at sea whenever I could so that I could become the most proficient combat systems engineer that I could. And uh, uh, much like Jimmy um, had folks who were mentoring me, uh, in particular, I made sure that I knew many master chiefs because those are the folks who know where all the, you know, what cans to kick to make things work and, and how to think about problem sets differently. Um, I also uh, was able to spend a year working in the shipyard to bring Arlie Burke out of the yard when we transferred from the cruisers over to the destroyers. Uh, I was in my uh, mid, early to mid twenties. And um, I actually went to the yard for a year to bring Burke out uh, at that time. I was a member of the Aegis uh, test team. So uh, Maine isn't the most uh, social place, but it sure was worth the return on the investment of that year plus in my life to get there and live with that ship every day and actually learning how to bring a ship out of the yards relative to the combat systems. Um, so just kind of fast forwarding, my career was spent heavily at the beginning in Port Miami, California, but I was a mobile engineer. So I kind of went wherever uh, I was needed. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, a few months at a time, I think one year I was at sea for like 260 something days. Um, so, uh, and again, the, the environment at that time was not gender neutral. So a um, lot of hard work at that time. So uh, at some point in my career, I, when I became a mom, I made a decision that I'd rather not be at sea as much as uh, I was as an in-service engineer and uh, transitioned to uh, Washington to the Navy's headquarters, at NAVC headquarters. And um, there I met, much like Jimmy, I started to meet some uh, very um, uh, interested uh, military members, admirals, also some, uh, some of the SESers who really, uh, I think the word you used was, uh, was coaching. They also became advocates. And I think when people tell you, hey, I wanna have a mentoring form appointment with you, I think we have to go beyond mentoring and, and pair ourselves up with people that we're willing to advocate for, coach and invest. And I'm actually a certified coach. I got my certification at uh, NC State during my time at Fort Bragg. So um, I say it only to say that I had folks who were my mentors, my advocates. Uh, one of them in particular, I was uh, almost afraid to approach him, but others encouraged me to do that. And it ended up being one of the, the, the best things I could have done for my career because that person became my advocate. I've been in the SES uh, core here for a little while and I've, um, I'm a little bit different, I think, in that I have tried different places. I've been uh, Navy. Uh, most recently, I was the Executive Director of Joint Special Operations Command. And the Special Ops community uh, is a very special community. And I enjoyed my time there. Uh, but I'm so happy to be back in DC. I was at Fort Bragg for a couple of years. I'm happy to be back at DC. 
and I'm in uh, OSD currently. And in a couple of weeks, I'll be heading back to be the executive director at aircraft carriers. So I've done quite a few jobs, uh, met uh, quite a few just fantastic people, including uh, some of the folks that you see on the screen here now. And um, I would say in terms of working with and for military, I think the greatest things that thing that military and civilian members can do for each other is learn that we all are under different um, evaluation systems. Uh, what makes uh, the military member think about their promotion set versus what makes a civilian uh, think about what they think about in their promotion sets are different things. So uh, I would say that one of the greatest things we can do for each other is learn about each other's systems that we work under when it comes to management of our career and those things that make us respond. So with that being said, uh, over for me, and now I'll go back to uh, whoever's next. So I tell you, uh, Karen, thanks so much for that. I did the pay pool. Uh, remember that thing? What a pain in the you know what. I couldn't tell what the hell I was reading or how it make a difference. But my God. And you talk about uh, getting the Aegis gold card. I got it two times over. One was all boy in the Vincennes. But Benfo was the first story that had women in the crew uh, from day one. And uh, again, both ships did great. Um, let's turn over to the Coast Guard. Let's go to the other side of the river. And Michelle, tell us about your story. And again, again uh, about working with uh, the Coast Guard and, and maybe even give us a good story about NASA too. Okay. So, um, you know, interestingly, I did start as a summer intern. Um, I, I, I started as a summer intern with the Army. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in any case, you know, kind of grew up through Army and went to several other agencies that were not military agencies, the so Department of Agriculture, um, you know, the Department of Commerce. And then I had the opportunity to come over to the Coast Guard. And I had my first uh, experience with them. I left and went back to the Department of Commerce and then came back to the Coast Guard where I stayed for 18 years. And then after 18 years, I left and went to NASA. And then after 10 months, came back to, uh, to the Coast Guard. So to me, uh, what does that tell you about the Coast Guard? One, um, I love them. <laughs> uh, I love the Coast Guard. It is an organization with the greatest missions uh, the people are phenomenal and, um, you know, just being able to grow in my career, they allowed me to, to, to leave and grow and welcome me back. And I think that's a sign of a very strong organization to do that. Um, but, but in terms of working with the military members, um, you know, my first exposure to a military member was a Lieutenant Colonel calling me and saying, Hey, I've got a job over here at the Pentagon. You want to come work for me? And, here I am, you know, just this uh, young woman starting out and said, sure, I'll come over there, you know, so I didn't see, I didn't know what I would be doing. And, and so, you know, but I worked with so many military members there, uh, really gave me that exposure. I came from a military family. I came, uh, you know, uh, from an Air Force family, as a matter of fact, with my mom uh, working for the Army as well. So I, I was all about, my sister worked uh, as a federal employee for the Army. So Really, that's what I knew. And I wanted to um, ser serve my country and, and as a federal employee, it's, it's how I was brought up. It's what I was um, raised to do. And the fact that I got to work with um, you know, the military uh, after being brought up as part of a military family made it that much better. Um, I think that um, you know, working with the military is, is unique compared to working in a federal agency that is all civilians. Um, there is a different uh, structure that's brought to it. There is, um, you know, just a lot of acronyms, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it is a, it's, it's very different. And uh, so when I went to NASA, uh, I'll give you a little story there, a great organization um, phenomenal getting to sit down with somebody that could tell you how they actually discover planets, uh, sitting down and being able to talk to an astronaut that's now the head of Kennedy Space Center. Um, 
just an amazing, amazing experience and being able to go up on the vessel assembly building and watch, look out over all of the various things at NASA. But, um, you know, every place has its culture. And, um, you know, it, it is a culture that at NASA that's ingrained because they are highly devoted to their mission, you know, and everybody knows what their mission is. And, um, but it's a, it's a culture where most people grow up in it. And, um, you know, coming in as a new employee uh, at, at an SES level was uh, somewhat challenging. But, you know, given, um, given the opportunity to come back to the Coast Guard, to, you know, work in civilian HR again, to work uh, in diversity inclusion, which is a passion to work in workforce forecasting and leadership. I mean, I was just 10 months later, ready to, you know, come back and work with the fine officers. Um, and we talked a little bit about en enlisted members and civilian members. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, getting to know the flag officers and the SES members and them getting to know you. While I firmly believe leaving to go to NASA was um, a, um, a something I needed to do for my career, I had relationships firmly established with those SES members, with those flag officers. I kept in touch when I left. Um, I didn't. I didn't let them forget me uh, when I left. And I think that that's important, keeping that network open. Um, because you never know when another opportunity is going to head your way. When I left it, um, and went to NASA, I but I didn't think I was ever going to be coming back to Coast Guard. I have my I planned to work until I left NASA as a retiree. <laughs> um, but that opportunity opened up. So all I would say is, you know, keeping your network open and broad and wide um, is critical. And I will, I'm, I'm dead. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's funny. You talked about uh, crossing between agencies. It reminds me of when Stephanie Easter uh, went over to be a salt for the Army. I went to visit her in her office and uh, closed the door and said, so I bet you miss the Navy now, don't you? Oh, Sinclair, these guys are crazy. <laughs> anyway. All right. Finishing up, Al Curry, shipmate. Now you have served in the Navy and, and the Coast Guard. Hey, they're both the sea services, they're the exact same culture, right? Absolutely not. And, uh, and before I go there, let me just give a little snippet on, on my background. So here I am, you know, ready to graduate from Savannah State University via their NRTC program. Um, before I, I just want to say this here, I've been shaped by many people. Uh, in my life. Primarily, my, my parents were a great instrument in who I am today. And those instructors at Savannah State, and especially the NRTC instructors, instructors down there, they shaped me for the path that I had charted for the Navy. They made sure that there, the, the little things that we didn't understand about military service, things in terms of how to compete um, with your, your colleagues and what that was all about, how to work uh, mold boards. And, and I think, you know, at Savannah State, I was a mold board, board guru by the time I got to the, to the fleet. There was nothing I didn't know about mold boards. Mold boards. But so I, the, the Navy chose to fly me directly from Savannah State, Savannah, Georgia, to Mombasa, Kenya to catch my first ship. And um, if it wasn't for jet lag and sleeping for three days just to catch up, I would have enjoyed that, that city a lot more. But from there, we went straight to the Persian Gulf. This was 1980. And I think everyone understand that during 1980 when the Iranian held the hostages. So we, we were on a picket line going back and forth in the Persian Gulf. That was the tour. We would go into Bahrain for fuel or stores, but back on the picket line. Uh, we spent so much time at sea that we had our customary two beers at sea. And so not to go on, but that first ship, I learned a lot. I was on my first ship for four years. Um, and I can tell you, I seen all types of leadership. The first captain I worked on them was a screamer. 
He was a true black shoe. He was pre-con CO. He had fired two XOs and was working on his third. Every department head has been fired at least once or twice on that ship. And it, it was a tough environment. But that didn't deter me because of the foundation I got coming into the Navy. I would talk to focus on my proficiency of craft, which learning my skills as a swell, and my proficiency in leadership. And that will, you know, way out in the end. And that's what I focus on. And um, so we transitioned from one CO to the next. And I think I went through four COs on that ship. I was on that ship for four years. Um, and we did four deployments in four years, including shifting the home port for overhaul. Um, but I was young. We spent at least 10 months out of the year at sea. I was enjoying it because I, were, I was becoming proficient in my craft. I enjoyed going to sea. I saw a lot. I learned a lot. And a lot of things that I had to use when I was CO, some of the lessons I learned as a JO was back on that particular ship. Um, on that ship, just being proficient, I became a junior, you know, qualified swole on that ship for over 16 months. I became the designated, you know, cunning officer for all special evolutions. Um, being on experience class story, I felt like I can put my driving skills against the best. There was nothing I couldn't do with that ship. And, um, and I wasn't like some people who, you know, in terms of trying to learn how to drive a ship, I made sure that I wanted to be better than the best on that ship, even the captain. So some people wanted the captain to tell them exactly what to do. I chose not to do that. I chose that I wanted to anticipate what the captain wanted me to do and bark out commands before he had the opportunity to tell me I was right or wrong. He can correct me, but as long as I was ahead of him, I was okay. And, and that worked out good for me because um, we had some tough evolutions that we went through working up carriers um, where 1,800 to 2,400 at night was my watch as OD, the junior most qualified person on the ship. And the captain would, you know, that was by his order. And you would think that the captain would be on the bridge. That's when the captain went down to his... Uh, at sea cabin and went to sleep. And so I kind of asked one day, I said, Captain, I don't understand. You give me this watch day in and day out while we working up you know, the Kennedy and the Vincent, why me? And he said, well, Al, it's, it's pretty simple. This is the only time I can get some sleep when you're on the bridge. And so, I mean, I could have got a big head from that, but it just accented what I've been taught in the de development from Savannah State in terms of being proficient in your craft and being proficient in leadership. And so throughout my entire Naval career, that's what I drew upon, just being proficient at what I do day in and day out. So I, I, my, my, my Naval career went backwards in terms of engineering plan. I started out on a gas turbine, two, a ship that was two years of age when I got there. Um, my department head tour, I went to a LST diesels, I mean, all diesels, nine diesel engines as chief engineer. However, I floated back to a gas turbine for my XO ride, Nicholson, but my CO ride was, was um, USS Pensacola, steam. I went from gas turbine to diesel to steam. Um, and I thought it was punishment, but I learned quickly that with steam, I had a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to drive the ship and maneuver the plan. But all in all, I spent 26 years in the Navy. 12 of those years I spent at sea. And, and, and I enjoyed the time I spent at sea because I became proficient at what I did. Um, after going to Monterey, when I wasn't at sea, I was in acquisition. You know, I'm one of the few people can say I've been at all three SISCOMs in the Navy without, with the exception of the, um, the supply system command. I've been at, did a tour at um, Spay War. I did a tour at uh, Nav Air. I did a tour at Nav C. And, um, and all of that um, prepped me for my tour with the Coast Guard. I can tell you that when I, when I retired from the Coast Guard, it was never my intent to go back and work as a federal government civilian. As a matter of fact, I said that was something I would never do. But I have learned you know, since then, never say never. Keep that out of your vocabulary because you never know. 
So the opportunity came up to apply for a position that really, I never saw the position. I had a friend that called me and said, oh, no, we're talking. There's a position. I know your background. I mean, it seemed like you're tailor-made tailor -made for this position. And so I kind of pushed it to the right and said, GS-15, I know those positions I already asked for. I know how the system works. It would be a waste of time. So I literally waited till the last day the cert was open. I said, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to apply. I answer all 100 and some questions at uh, Michelle and the essays <laughs> and uploaded my resume. And it was like literally three days later, I got a call from this guy called Dan Abel, who retired as a three-star in the Coast Guard. I said, hey, we just got your resume and we want you to come in for an interview. Can you come in next week? And I said, well, yeah, I can work some things. And long story short, I really got hired from that 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 one visit. And after talking to Dan Abel, he had, he said, you know, Al, reason we keyed it, keyed on you is that you had something that we in your record that we didn't think it exists. We never we didn't think that someone with a level three um, certification PM that worked for Nav C, worked for Spaywar, worked for Nav Air existed. So we had to see you. And so obviously the interview went well. I, they hired me. Um, I was in, you know, 15 for about, you know, four, four years. Um, a month after being hired in the Coast Guard, something interesting happened to me is that I found myself in a meeting with the Commandant of the Coast Guard. And I say, wow, you no, know, you get to the top really quickly in the Coast Guard. I spent 26 years in the Navy and never had an opportunity to have a session with the CNO. So, so, and not only that, in some of the meetings in terms of reviews with contractors, you know, being here with one star, and at that time, I'm a courier. I remember very vividly, we were in this meeting and something was going on and he turned around and he said, Al, what you think? And I had to do a double take because my time in the Navy uh, Admiral never asked me what I thought. They told me what to think. And so I said from that moment on, the yeah, Coast we, Guard is different. Yeah, we didn't care. We don't care. I know. <laughs> I said the Coast Guard is different. And one thing I found out about the Coast Guard, Coast Guard, would, would, I mean, after being there for a little while, I have to understand that there is a difference between the Coast Guard and the Navy. I was naive in my, in my entry into the Coast Guard that the Coast Guard was a mini Navy and they operated the same. But if you understand the ethos of the Coast Guard versus the Navy, and from this simple view shed in, in terms of the kill chain, the Navy is into taking lives, the Coast Guard is into saving lives. There lies a different kill chain. There lies a different methodology in how people are motivated and think. And the Navy, if you do, if you take risks and it doesn't work out, you're going to be penalized. And the Coast Guard, if you take less, take risks, you're going to be rewarded. And the Coast Guard, where you get penalized if you do nothing, because it goes to the thing, you're saving a life. If that doesn't work, do something else. Keep doing something until you save a life. It took me about a year and a half to understand that mentality of the Coast Guard. But I tell you that since being in the Coast Guard, I had the opportunity to compete for the position I'm in. And thankful to Michelle, because Michelle, uh, everybody who matriculated into the SES community and the Coast Guard had to go through Michelle. And that just a gauntlet, a gauntlet that she had to go through. And I, I'm thankful for her. She worked with me on the ECQs. Boy, but that was tre treacherous. And, um, but but I... I, I matriculated into this position I'm in now, which is the deputy or the deputy chief engineer for the Coast Guard. I tell you what, I enjoy going to work each day for several reasons. One is because of the people that I work with day in and day out. Coast Guard is small, but the Coast Guard punches way above his weight class. I mean, my my SES colleagues, my 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 flag officer colleagues. I mean, it's just a very good collaboration between everyone. Everyone is working in unison because we all understand the mission. Another thing I like about the Coast Guard is the mission set. For some reason, it just, you know, it just, it just makes you want to be part of that organization. So I've had a very good time. I don't have time for a boring day, um, day in and day out. 
but I go to work each day with a smile on my face because I'm living a dream. And I saw uh, Alvin Manson Brown down there because one of the things, you know, you say, now nah, you doing, sir, I'm living a dream. I am living a dream. I don't have time for a boring day. You know, as the deputy chief engineer, aeronautical engineers, those guys work for me. The naval engineers, they work for me. The civil work for me. Um, so any one day and also environmental and fuel. So I don't have time to get bored. I mean, because I have enough issues on my plate. But one thing about me is that someone asked me one time and say, no, so what are you good at? And I'll tell you very quickly, I think I'm good at two things. One is program management and two, driving a ship. Not being braggadocious is just that if I know where my strengths are and I think those are my strengths. And so I rely on those. And, um, but each day, day in and day out, just being able to deal with people, deal with the different problem sets in the Coast Guard, don't get me wrong, the problems are hard because we don't have the money or the budget that the Navy DOD has. So there's always a struggle. There's always a fight. But at the end, we managed to get the job done. So I, I, it has been very fulfilling. I had some great leaders in the Coast Guard. Uh, Admiral Manson Brown, working with him. You had working with you know, uh, Steve Rashawn, retired Admiral Rashawn. Um, also the other Admiral Brown, the first Admiral Errol Brown. Mike Johnson, who is, is an Admiral now, worked for me one time as an 05. So I had the opportunity to mentor him. He called me a couple of times about, you know, fit rep, you know, how to position himself. So I agree with Karen. Now, we're in a great position where we can be great advocates for people in uniform because we can talk to flag officers. We can put that spotlight on someone and say, you got to watch this individual. And I don't mind bringing their names up 10 times or 100 times, but... And, but I think I cut it off here, sync, and so we can roll on with the other part of the program. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Al. That was, that was a great, uh, great run through uh, and, and a fabulous career. Hey, um, so one of the things that uh, I like to ask of this group, and I'm gonna start with you, Karen. Um, what are some of the missteps, mistakes, uh, things that could have been done better by first timers in terms of uh, military folks who are coming in to work with uh, uh, civilians for the first time? Some of the things that could have been done better. Well, I think that I kind of alluded to it earlier and I believe that I'll use a real example. So at, um, I was a SES uh, for Army. I was selected as SES with Navy, but as you know, as acquisition professionals, we do rotate on occasion. Um, and so, and usually by slating. And so when I went to, to JSOC, I loved uh, some of the structure that the Army provided from the perspective of you had to uh, take supervisory training in order to supervise civilians. That was an Army policy. And then JSOC further tightened and said, you have to go take two more days of JSOC training on it. And I think a misstep that I saw was people who refused to, without being having their arms twisted, take that training. And if you have been um, a military member accustomed to certain approaches to personnel systems, we already talked about that earlier, um, environments, uh, the military, uh, the different systems of the military members. Uh, a big misstep I think that you make and that civilians make too, frankly, is not taking the opportunity again to learn about those things that can land us all in hot water if we uh, don't take a second to at least get familiarization. So I think that's a common misstep. Uh, relative to when you start to have military members and civilian members mix in. And I think it's important that we are together, but we, it's important that we take the time to learn about each other's uh, systems that we're all subject to, uh, including the way we train. So I think, uh, uh, again, I don't wanna necessarily paint it as mistakes, but it is a mistake 
to forego the opportunity to learn about each other's cultures when we come together so that you don't have the clash, but you actually have the ability to embrace based upon knowledge and, and not almost, um, you know, some folks, um, if, if, I, if, if, I, if you graded everybody under you a straight five, I have no way to try to discern how to do things, but um, it was easier for you to do that rather than to go take training or to, you know, take a moment uh, to invest in the fact that, that civilians learn through that process of feedback. So anyway, it's one, that's one of the biggest things I've seen is the devaluing of learning about each other's systems that we grow up uh, under. And again, those things that we care about a lot, which is how are we perceived by those who evaluate us? So, over. Great point, great point. I actually was gonna ask uh, several of you all the same question, but I see I got a hand up uh, from Colonel Thomas, who's been running our, our symposium. Colonel Thomas, which question? Go ahead and come off mic and ask. Yes, sir, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was just wondering if each of you could address the dynamic of being a civilian SES, so that's leadership, during change of administrations. You've all you know, been SESs for a while um, and have experienced multiple administrations. So if you could kind of talk through uh, your experience of that, um, and especially how you think it's your role to maybe assist that the military members through that that transition as well. So, so let me add to her question. Talk about that. Also, talk about how it is to go from one CNO to another CNO, or one commandant to another commandant uh, as well. And I'm going to start with you, Michelle. Then go to Jimmy. Then go to Al, and then to Karen. Yeah, that's such an interesting question because we were having a morale event today and, um, you know, out in front of the uh, flag suite uh, for the Assistant Commandant for Human Resources, we have all the pictures of the previous Assistant Commandants. And I looked at that and with my career span in the Coast Guard, I've served under 11 different Assistant Commandants. And um, so, you know, that in itself is kind of a, it, you know, you are constantly in a situation of um, teaching whoever's new coming in, here's what we do, here's what you need to be concerned about, here um, is, you know, the land, the, the landmines you might step on, here are the, the things that people are going to come to you about that they come to, um, they come to every assist, assistant commandant that comes in about. And, um, you know, here's how you, you can handle that. So there's, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you, when you talk about change of administration, there's just, there's, it doesn't even have to be right. A change in administration. It's just constant change in leadership. And our commandant comes in, you know, of course, every four years and, and they come in and they have a four year period to accomplish what they have, you know, come through the service the challenges they've had and what they're going to, you know, address in their tenure there. So you you also have that piece um, where you're you're kind of, um, you know, one one commandant thinks this way and you're you're going uh, this direction and then um, another commandant wants to to take it in a, in a little bit different direction. So you're trying to you know shift yourself for that and then layer on then a change in you know, administration and, um, you know, the, the Department of Homeland Security secretary changing. Um, then you've got all of these things kind of flowing down. So you might have the secretary changing. So you've got to change administration. You've got a commandant that, um, you know, changes. And then you've got even your assistant commandants that change. And so you have to, trying to um, master that ability to change to uh, a leadership, uh, ch change in leadership dynamic is critical. And, um, you know, I'm sure my colleagues can, can certainly speak to this. Uh, I know Mr. Curry can and the number of assistant commandants he's probably worked with, um, you know, just in, in his tenure with the Coast Guard. And, um, you know, it, it is trying to ensure that, you know, you're there to, um, um, help that individual achieve their goals 
in that period of time that they have, because it's not, you know, unlike a civilian that can stay there, like I have in different jobs, of course, but uh, for 23 years, um, they have two years, one year, four year um, to, to do what it is that they're going to accomplish to change that organization. And you have to be there working with them, um, also helping your staff get through that change. Um, and that's, that, that's also, you know, a challenge because change is hard <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, a, it's, it can be quite frightening, um, when, when your supervisor or your assistant commandant is changing every couple of years and you've got to make sure that you're helping them understand your value to the organization and what you do and what you contribute. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question and I will turn it over to my colleagues. Jimmy. Uh, one of the things that I've kind of held as a sort of a steady focus throughout changes of administration, changes of leadership, is that, you know, we all take the oath of office to, and you swear your, your allegiance to that constitution. So regardless of the political swing one way or another, I'm grounded in, I've got to provide capability to people who need it. And I've got to support people who are supporting those people who are going into harm's way. So I, I keep that focus. And one of the things that you have to do for your staff being an SES is you need to buffer them from that, the, the, all of the extra noise, all of the disruptive change. Uh, constructive tension is great. In every situation, constructive tension is great. But when it becomes politically fired or this particular person has an initiative that they've got to see through and you can see that no one's really asking for what they're driving towards. So why am I going to run towards it and help them sort it out? So that's when you need to have a conversations with a conversation with folks about what's really motivating the thing that you're trying to achieve. And I've found that if your heart's in the right place doing what we're doing, you're going to come out on the right end, sunny side up every single time. But you have to be that buffer and voice of reason to others who may be driven by other motivations. And and I've been called into various political, you know, elected officials offices and going into the office. I knew what the outcome was going to be. This person's going to ask me to do something that I am not going to do. And the second that the door closes, they understand it also. Hey, when you leave here, I was told when you leave this office, the only thing that you're going to talk about is I ripped your face off. But you go keep doing the right thing that you're doing for the department. <laughs> so so, uh, so they have to put on faces. They have to put on different airs for the audiences that they're trying to, to please. But I don't get caught up in it and I don't let others around me get consumed by it because we're here for a greater calling. And, and that has to remain focused at all times. Over. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Michelle. Al, same question. How do you deal with changes of administration? I think, I mean, from a SES standpoint, um, it's no different than someone in uniform. You have to be apolitical. I mean, you can't, you can't, because a civilian will get in trouble just as quick as a military person. So you have to be able to take that stance where you're executing the mission of the organization in terms of, and if you're speaking for the organization, we all have bosses and we have to, the Coast Guard has to report to someone, whether it's a budget or whatever, we can't get ahead of the president or OMB or DHS. We have to make sure that we're in sync with what they are going to propose and we don't get outside of that lane. Coast Guard is unique as compared to some of my DOD brethren that we don't have a political assigned to the Coast Guard. And, and, and that's a good, I mean, from our standpoint, that's a good thing because we don't have to worry about some of those, those things. But in terms of politics, what drives me and goes back to that very first ship I was on. One of the things that I learned that was, was psychosync on that ship is that there's two things you don't talk about in the wardrobe. That's politics and religion because both could be so divisive that it tears away at cohesion of the organization. So those, and so for my entire career, I stay away from those two, two items, especially in the workplace. But in terms of, we're not immune to what's going on in the real world. What you have to translate as a leader, what does it mean to your organization? And how, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whether it's new commandant or new president, you're gonna to have to do some pivoting. 
So you have to be able to, to correlate that and be able to speak from a leadership position to your people and give new margin orders, but without being political in the process. Over. Amen, brother. I, I, I tell people all the time, everybody should vote, but nobody needs to know who I'm voting for. Absolutely. So Karen, you're the last up, same question. How do you deal with change of administrations? So I would echo pretty much everything that's been said because the job of the SES is to uh, retain a level of, of continuity as these things change uh, around you. Uh, I'm apolitical. I'm like you, who I vote for is not something I ever bring into the office. I try to reserve any comments. Uh, even about things at current events. I just don't think it, it can, it's fruitful sometimes. My passion, though, is the warfighter, the operator in the case of special ops, the sailor in the case of the Navy, soldier when I was with the Army. So, so my focus is, is, is so on the people who depend on us and the taxpayer, honestly, um, that I don't really think a lot about the political aspect of, of it. But I do also know that during the changes of administration and other times when leadership changes can occur, I am true to myself. And I know if I'm in an environment where I'm not gonna thrive and I'm not gonna be like what Al said earlier with that smile on my face coming in every day, feeling the way I wanna feel. And so um, um, I'm not the type person um, who personally is afraid to say, you know what, I think I'd like to try something different or someplace different. So as those things happen around us, I think we have to be willing to know that although we may be apolitical, um, we may be able to thrive in just about any and every environment. We are a continuity factor. You name all the things that have been said previously. We also have to know ourselves and know when our best may be contributing in some other place. So thank you, Karen. I'm gonna stick with you and ask a follow-up question that will go through the, the team. And again, everybody who's got a question, please raise your hand or type it in the chat. Uh, let me know you, you have a question uh, for this wonderful panel. So Karen, oh, Kalela's back up again. Same question, team, another question? I do have another question, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I had a question too, but I'll let you. <laughs> so I, I sat in a, a seminar last year about um, becoming an SES. And one of the, the key takeaways that I garnered was that, and this is similar to what we've been talking about in the first two days of the symposium, uh, really folks end up doing their best when they have a sponsor slash advocate. Um, and I gathered that from the SES pathway as well. So my question to each of you is, who, if, if anyone, have you ever sponsored as an advocate uh, to put them on the path to becoming an SES uh, as well, or as, you know, a replacement for you as you, you look to grow, grow your own core? Thank you. Let's start with, uh, let's start with you, Karen. Okay, so I would never say exactly who so much as um, I tend to, when people appeal to me as future leaders, um, I tell folks when they come in to see me, you don't want to be mentored or advocated for by me, coached by me, if you're not ready to do some homework. So that's the first thing is we need to understand and talk about, I like to use the military career planner that a lot of the the military officers that I work with use. I like people to think about their strategy. Hey, if you are a parent uh, in your life, if you have kids starting high school, that may not be the time for you to uh, you know, go uh, move a thousand miles away. So I like people to think about themselves holistically um, and, and do that homework and be willing to, to do more than just be advocated for, but to earn some of that. So while I do have folks that I truly uh, mentor and I advocate for them. I have folks that I coach here. You know, there's a difference in mentoring, advocating, uh, coaching, there's therapy, 
<laughs> you name the full range of what you need to be able to do and know that you're not good at too when you're interfacing with people. Um, but to say that you put them on the path to SES, um, I, I think I would be careful saying that because sometimes you are just introducing people to the oyster that's, you know, that's their world. And if it happens that they're SES material, then boy, um, do I really have serious discussions with them? Like, hey, it can't be the pay. Don't even think about it from that perspective because you, you're going to be probably underpaid relative to your, your private industry peers. Hey, are you used to being scrutinized? Hey, are you used to the fact that you can't travel and take things, uh, you know, um, you know, less than seriously because the least little infraction, you can get attention for that. So to me, when you say putting people on the path to it, it starts so early and there's so much work to get people thinking about what they think is this, this place to uh, where I guess it's the, um, you know, you've arrived and you really have not. What you've arrived at is a lot of work, a lot of scrutiny, um, a lot of um, attention to detail, but the ability to influence decisions, which is the greatest impact. Uh, and so when I think about people and, and, and who uh, I know or who I interface with, but I think our SES material, that's such a long uh, process and relationship that comes out of that. Now I've talked to many people, I help many people with resumes, uh, ECQs, um, you know, talking to them about what the QRB boards and different processes look like. and do a lot of time with that sort of thing, but that's, you know, that's almost like a transaction. And so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but I, I think it's it's hard to say putting people on the SES path so much as it is, it's a little bit probably for me more accurate to say helping people to discover how to invest in themselves and open up their aperture for whatever it looks like. And oh, by the way, a lot of the folks that I um, interface with who come to me for mentoring, I'm, I send them back to, if they're 13, I send them back to the 14 and 15 level. Talk to those folks who are in the positions that you should be aspiring to before you think you're ready for this because there's a lot more than what it looks like. So it, it, it's a very, to me, um, uh, time uh, intensive and deliberate um, set of relationships when you start, um, I guess, helping people who aspire to the SES. Over. Karen, thank you so much. That was a, a great response to me. Same question to, to you, uh, Jimmy Smith. Uh, but let me add this part. Tell the truth. It really pisses you SES is off when some uh, 06 goes straight from being uniform to being an SES or a general, does it? It pisses you guys off. Come on, admit it. I've heard I've heard y'all say it, you know, in the bar when you had a drink or two. <laughs> I, I don't believe I have a, a particular instance where that's actually reached the level of pissing me off because I probably wasn't applying for the job but didn't want it anyway. <laughs> and if it was on the OpNav staff, you can be an SES on the OpNav staff. I'm good with that. Take those opportunities because I need you to stay away from the secretariat side. <laughs> but I, I, I will uh, applaud Karen for what she said because she is absolutely spot on. It's, there's not one person but relationships. And this has been built over, I mean, I made SES at the 19 year point and I called up my mentor. I told, told you his name earlier, Vice Admiral Paul Sullivan. I called him up and he had been retired in his first private sector job. And I called him up right after I called my parents, let him know I made SES. And he was like, wait a second, how old are you? And I was like, I'm 42. He was like, we had a plan for you to make SES when you were 40. And then the conversation turned completely sour on me. This man is chastising me and himself for what did we do to lose two years? We had a plan to get you there. But the fact that the band knew my age after he had retired and knew that I wasn't 40 years old and I made SES, he started flogging himself with, how did I let you down? How did I 
not make sure that you were going to be in SES at the age of 40. And I was like, Sully, nobody makes SES at the age of 40. I'm good. You know, it's, it's all fine here. Let's just take a knee. Let's just, let's just celebrate in the moment. He spent 15 minutes talking about why I didn't achieve it two years earlier. And then I hung up on him. I literally, and then I picked the phone up and I called him right back because I, I told him the phone slipped out pain. But, uh, <laughs> but, but this is someone who literally cared and still cares to this day. And we have conversations, texting, emails back and forth on a variety of topics. He has been the single most influential person in my career. And, and I'm grateful for it. But he also did that to many other people, what he was doing for me. So my payback to him, and he told me this, your payback for what I've done for you is that you will do it for others. So the training that Ms. Thomas talked about, that she went to the So You Want to Be an SES uh, training event that the Navy sponsored, um, I've led that training for the last 11 years. And we put it on every time in the fall. We do it in person prior to COVID. Last year, we did it virtually. And we typically get about 250 people at the GS 15, 14, 13 level to come to this training to be inspired to want to be an SES. And I bring in the commandant, I bring in the SECNAV, I bring in the, the CNO to talk from a military standpoint. And then I bring in senior leaders, be it political, be it career, to talk to folks. And then after they leave, we have a conversation about, so here are the things that you're required required to do in order to be an SES. We talk about the ECQs, we talk about the interview process. During this training, we actually have mock interviews conducted during the training. And this is led by SES members who are doing this. So giving back and making sure that you're growing the next population of folks, the next generation of folks to take over and relieve you, it's that same mentality that we execute through this program. And, and I get a great deal of joy out of it. Like Karen, I help people with their ECQs, resume building. We even do mock interviews with people. And to tell you the truth, my first SES interview, I had three mock interviews with African-American SESs prior to going into my real interview. And it was absolutely invaluable because every interview prior to that in my life was one way. And this was totally different. And I would have walked in and goofed this up if they didn't take me to the side and prepare me for the opportunity that I was walking in for. So giving back, making sure others have the same chance that I had in order to achieve what you want to achieve. I want to foster that. I want to give you the opportunity to get what has been given to me because I'm not selfish about it. I will give this away at any moment's notice to anyone who wants the responsibility. But like Karen, you have to own it. Responsibility, accountability, the authority, those three things have to work in balance and you have to want them, not I'll do it to get the prestige of being an SES. I, I don't really see this prestige of being an SES. I, I don't get anything extra <laughs> because of it. You know, you get a title, but Give me a free bowl of soup, and I think I'll be just as happy. <laughs> can, I, can I be a witness to? Uh, I remember when um, I, I was having my ECQs reviewed, and um, I sent them to Jimmy, and um, I was expecting, you know, a lot more uh, depth, instructiveness, something. I was expecting to take his pen. All he came back was too long, <laughs> too much, too verbose. And he made me go through that exercise of getting it down to something that would pass the OPM QRB process. But I was like, uh, are you gonna like uh, write down some stuff? Give me some hints, you know? He's like, no, just read it and tell the story better. I was like, oh God. So yeah, that, that so even at that level, I'm a witness to what Jimmy said. I had, he, he had, he, I was annoyed, but um, he challenged me to tell my own story. And I had I had his example and other examples, but the guy didn't pull out the pen and write it for me. He was like, too long. I was like, if he says too too much one more time, I'm going to choke him. But, but yeah, he, he, I'm a witness when he says, you know, you got to do the work. Yeah, I, and, and we have this requirement that the SES ECQs are a maximum of 10 pages, and everybody fills them out to be 10 pages long. I've sat on QRBs before. If you can't tell me that story in eight pages, 
it's not an executive summary if you can't get it down to the and I don't need I, I will tell you the people who train me on how to write ECQs there are no words that end in ER, LY. You don't need to dress up what you've done in your career. Just say what it was and show that you're proficient so the QRB can check the box that you're proficient. That's it. But but making it look colorful and different shades of plaid and gray and green, I don't need that. <laughs> so uh, so I, I will be brutally uh, honest when it comes to you're doing too much. And I, I, I had this PhD from... SSP, this is the last example I'll tell you. I had this PhD rocket scientist from SSP give me his ECQs, and his ECQs told the history of the Trident D5 program. It was a novel. I'm thinking you could sell this on the open market, but you will never pass into the SES with what you wrote down. And he couldn't for the life of him understand why I wasn't understanding what he was writing. I got it. It won't pass the board. He flunked out twice had to recompete for the job when the Admiral offered it again, flunked out one more time and the Admiral said, look, if you don't listen to what Jimmy's telling you, um, I'm not gonna hold this job open for you any longer. And he came back to me after on the second year to retry again. Do you have those notes that you gave me uh, regarding the first markup of my ECQs? Yes, I do. And here they are. And he's like, I'm gonna follow your instruction this time. Guess what? He made it through the gauntlet. <laughs> so you can, you can try as hard as you want, tilt at the windmill if you want to, but every now and then that thing hits you in the head. It, do it all you want, but it's entertaining to me to watch you come back when all you had to do was pass me once. <laughs> Bottom line up front, most important words. Absolutely. Are. Absolutely. Hey, Al, I see you come off mute. B, I know you had your hand up. I'm going to come to you next. Al, did you have something you wanted to share? Well, I think I, I, I did what Karen and uh, Jim had said, but oh, before I get started, okay, I do a shout out to uh, Laura Stubbs. Hi, Laurie. <laughs> um, but uh, as I see names that I haven't talked to in a long time, I just want to give a shout, shout out. I, I think, you know, for me, I'm probably a little bit different, you know, Coast Guard headquarters where mentoring, I embrace that. It's, it's part of, I take it as part of my job to mentor. So I don't care if you're a contractor, you're a civilian, you're military, or, or what, if you want my time, you knock on my door, I have an open door policy. And um, if I'm not you know, responding to a crisis, I would typically stop and entertain that member because for me, that member is important. And, um, and I've even done mock interviews in my room, uh, in my office, but I've done all of that. I also participate with the Asian American Government, Government Executive Network, or do the same thing Jimmy do. We do mark interviews. Um, we um, give a spiel about you know what it means to be an SES. Do speed mentoring. We're always doing that. What I shy away from is the former mentoring program because that just eats up so much time. And one of the things I learned as an SES is that you know a lot of people come in, a lot of people have resume. I would read the resume, but one thing I won't do, I won't allow a person to leave me homework. When you walk in with your resume you walk out with your resume. Because nine times out of 10, if I take it and I say, I'm gonna look at it, my inbox is continually increasing. And by the time I recognize I wasn't, because you came back and say, hey, have you looked at my resume? Now I got to find it. So vice going, making you upset and making me upset because I feel bad because I didn't get back to you information. One of my policies is that when you walk in with homework, I mean, with resumes, you're going to walk out with homework. And that way, you're not mad at me. It's back on you to do the things that you need to do. But in terms of ECQs, I think one of the hardest things for me in the whole process was getting to the point where I said, I, I did this, I. Because naturally, there's always, it's not just been you. But if you want to write ECQs, you have to get to the point where you talk about I, I. Now, if you can't get that to that point, then it's going to be a long, long, long um, walk. But like Karen said, it has to be something you want to do. You have to embrace this opportunity. Um, I, I, I mean, I've been advocates. I've been mentors for probably three or four people who matriculate into the SES community. But it wasn't just me. I was just one link in that chain 
that help them get through. And I think, you know, that's a big part of being SAS, being advocates, and not only within the command, but also outside of command. And for the DOD side of the house, need to come to the Coast Guard. You guys deal with tiers. We don't have any tier structure. So sorry, I just had to get that dig in. <laughs> All right. B, you had a question. I did, but I think um, Mr. Smith answered my question. But, um, and it was to do with the training, because I had knew someone who was trying to get into the SES and I think she was saying she was actually wondering if the training was was necessary but I would say if you didn't get the it seems like if you don't get the training your chances of getting into SES is nil to I would say very slow very low is that correct I'm gonna ask Michelle I, I, I wouldn't say that sink um, I would, this is Al Curry. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I'm one of the ones that and I did not go through an SES development program. Okay. Uh, again, it goes to, I mean, it depends on people who are advocating for you, people who knows you, and people who know that if you can compete at the next level, they're going to be speaking up for you. And that's what happened in my case is that now actually I got pulled out of, the, out of acquisition into sustainment into the position I'm in. Okay. And uh, and I never figured out how why they did that because I wasn't even in that organization. But once I got up there, I kind of understood what was going on. So okay, okay. So but if I, I have another. I'm going to ask Michelle before we get to your question. Second question, uh, B. I'm going to ask Michelle because she works in HR, so she sees lots of this. No, she can. Okay. I do. You. So um, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I think there are some organizations that value. Um, the candidate development program. That is a way to advance into their SES. They use it quite a bit as a tool for um, identifying those individuals that you know, have the executive core qualifications. Because if you go through a formalized candidate development program, the goal is for you to come out of there with your ECQs certified by OPM. Okay. And so that makes you, you know, an, what, what we call a non-competitive candidate, meaning you're already then, if a job opens, you compete with the SES for that, right? So, um, you know, it depends on the organization because some organizations pull from that program all the time. Okay. Um, but to Al's point, um, you don't need to go through um, a candidate development program to become an SES member. I think, you know, as I was listening to my colleagues, one thing you heard over and over and over again, ECQs, ECQs, <laughs> ECQs. And I think, you know, if I were to um, um, want to guide somebody, I would say, pull those, pull those off the OPM website, understand what they are. There's five ECQs. They have competencies associated with them. Um, you know, I, I know as I was considering um, an SES, there, there were, as I looked at those ECQs, as I looked at those competencies, there were areas that I knew, you know, if I wanted to become an SES member, I needed to focus on, I needed to get experience in. And so those can actually, if that's something you aspire to, those can help you understand what are the things that they're going to be looking for from me when I decide that, you know, because that's a it's a personal decision, obviously, for everybody if they want to pursue an SES, because some people, they're happy. They are happy never never becoming an SES member, right? They love being a 13, a 14, or a 15. So it's just a very personal decision. But, um, you know, I, I, I would point to those ECQs because they will really tell you what it, what it is to be an executive and what the board specifically, the QRB is gonna be looking for um, when it comes time to certify your qualifications. Okay, so I have two questions. The other uh, question is which is a sub of that, how difficult it, is it to get into the training? And I, know if, I don't know if it differs by service, if the training is offered by service. And the other question is, what's the average number of times, whether it's years or whatever, that it takes the person to become an SES? So Michelle, Those who weren't like Al Curry. <laughs> Michelle, why don't you start? And then if anybody else has got, because you're, you're HR, so you see this all the time. Thank you. So different agencies will have um, a candidate development program. So, um, you know, you can search 
uh, on OPM and, and uh, USA Jobs and look for candidate development programs. DHS has a candidate development program. They, they're just now um, issuing their certificates and, and making selections off of that. So they do a program yearly um, and all the components within DHS use that program. But very, I, I've, I've seen HUD does a program. And so you can apply to these programs as, um, you know, as an outside candidate. They're not usually limited to, you know, the um, agency that they're uh, being announced for. Um, they are highly competitive uh, because these are individuals that, um, you know, they're probably uh, SES material already, or they're, you know, seeing that there's something that they need in their background to become an SES, and it gives them rotational opportunities to kind of shore up uh, some areas that they may need extra help in. So very highly competitive programs. In terms of, you know, how how many times, um, you know, does it take to, be, you know, to apply to a job to become an SES? I, well, I mean, I think that's going to depend by person. Sounds like Jimmy, you know, uh, had and, and others one time, uh, mine was twice. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think everybody's going to have their own experience with that. Getting through the um, the ECQ process, the QRB. If you are um, guided well, if you do what you should do, have have uh, other SES members look at them, uh, give them. A very very thorough read. Don't have any mistakes in them. Don't put extraneous information in there. Have very strong examples. Follow. There's a model that you follow in writing them. Uh, challenge, context, action, results. If you follow that model, if you have measurable results, um, you, you should get through in one time. Um, and uh, I will I will proudly say that um, you know. Yes, I put our SES members through the gauntlet, as Mr. Curry said, <laughs> but we get through in one time. So, um, it, you know, I, I pride myself on that, but they don't go out of the Coast Guard if I don't think that they can make it through one time. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's a different way of writing, as he said, um, using that I and, and um, talking about yourself, it's not easy for a lot of people to do. So I hope that answered your question and I will yield my time. It does, thank you. Can I, can I have some perspective to that too? Cause I'm a graduate of a CDP program and um, you do not have to be in the department but what when you're looking for a CDP program you wanna look for one that's OPM certified because those are the ones that you graduate with the opportunity to get your ECQ certified is not required but what's the point in going through the program if you're not willing to do that? Also, those programs have fees. So wherever you work has to be willing to pay. When I was with the Marine Corps, and so again, I, I, another service was when I uh, was um, in a program, an OPM certified program, believe it or not, as a defense employee, it was administered by the Department of Agriculture. And um, it's they're advertising USA jobs, but it cost the Marine Corps approximately forty thousand dollars for me to go through that program, and it includes your administration, and it also includes the fact that you have to go to in the case of the one I was in, you have to go uh, get a uh, certification. Went, went to American University for an entire year, so there's a lot of very uh, strenuous, I would say, and personal time commitments and, and work time commitments that go into those programs. So it's not as simple as apply um, and get in because even the interview process is run by OPM. There's like three or four rounds of interviews. So I echo what Michelle said when that it's a very competitive program. Very few people get in those, but they are there. And, and don't, if you think you are interested in that and your agency or organization will sponsor the cost, uh, don't look only inside of your, in DOD in this case, uh, look other places, uh, Homeland Security uh, for the folks who are in the Coast Guard should not be your only place you're looking. Any place, again, where it's OPM certified is where I recommend you look for those programs. The other thing I wanted to say is when you talked about getting into the SES, 
When I was with Army uh, as an SCS, one of the things we were required to do, and I really loved it, was go to Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, and, and we did the advanced course. And when I was preparing that information, those are folks who are interested in advancing uh, their careers, and, and they're the, the GS level senior leaders. Uh, I went to the OPM site and I looked at some of the metrics around the SES. And so Army, as an example, if there's a total of, I uh, think, uh, 250,000 to 300,000 personnel, and the SES core makes up about 300 or so of those, or maybe even less, that's 0.001%, I think is the number approximately, of people who make it into that SES level. The Navy, I think, has about 250,000 uh, personnel and about 230 uh, SES billets. And the number is 0.00 something again. Uh, OSD has about 300 um, SES billets. And I think the number is about 350,000 or something like that person. OPM has these metrics on their site. And they're usually about a year, year and a half dated. But if you want to get a sense of, of uh, you know, who kind of makes it across that particular goal post, you, uh, go to OPM site, look at the metrics, and it can tell you or give you an indicator of how competitive it is to get into that end of the, the workforce. However, that's not to discourage one so much as it is to say, not only is the SES a place to aspire to, but there are so many, as I tell people, fantastic GS jobs that we overlook sometimes because we're shooting for that 0. 0.00 whatever percent. Uh, and there's some other things in between where you might be now in that particular uh, goalpost, over. So, so thank you, that's a great conversation. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna take uh, uh, the last question and it's a selfish one. I'm the president of the National Naval Officers Association. And I think we've got a great association been around 49 years, be 50 years next year. I'm gonna ask each one of you, and since Karen, you are unmuted, I'm gonna ask you first. Um, do you think that the In and Away is an organization that would benefit either SESs or GSs? And if so, name one thing that we should be doing in order to make that a reality. Okay, so I'm glad I went first because I can set the bar for the others. I'm a life member of NNOA. The first meeting I went to where a, a friend of mine who is a retired uh, Navy uh, 05, uh, I, I wrote my check on the spot and it wasn't that expensive. It cost me less to do that than, a life, than my lifetime membership and my sorority fees are. So, so uh, General Bailey, um, retired Marine Corps general was, uh, I think, uh, the chairman at that time, or maybe he was the sponsor for that event. And I was so inspired uh, by the messaging. And I was inspired by the fact that there were people from uh, several chapters coming together and they were big on the encouraging of each other, irregardless of the walk. Uh, military civilians coming together, encouraging each other, uh, talking things through uh, the event I went to, there was, you know, there was food and all that type of stuff, but it was also booths and there was exchange of information. And I think that's the most important, or one of the most important things that NNOA does and should continue to do, which is be a venue where like-minded people who aspire to great things can continue to come together and encourage each other be sounding boards for each other, be networking opportunities for each other. I thought that event was uh, fantastic. It was good enough. Again, I wrote my check to become a lifetime member. Uh, now I need to encourage myself and maybe you can, you can keep me encouraged to, to be involved in more of the activities. Uh, but I think, again, that's the greatest thing you do is you bring people together around um, others who might be like-minded, goal-oriented, and above all, want to contribute and pay back to others. Over. Thank you. Same question to you, Jimmy. Uh, one of the things that I've sort of picked up over the course of my career, having worked, you know, for the Navy the entire time, but I've worked in different camps. I worked in the submarine community, worked in the Aegis community, 
worked over at SSP. And from a, a military uh, standpoint, we have these different tribes that we all live in, right? And it's my tribe, you know, stab your tribe kind of mentality in certain cases where we're dealing with folks, so especially when it comes to budget and programs and seeing things through. Um, I think this organization does an outstanding job of bringing together the tribes. Let's talk about the greater good of what we're all here for. And, and I, but I see a lot of people get pretty fixated on, I'm in my community and that's where I live, that's where I reside, that's where I stay, no one, and you're maybe not even welcome in. And I remember when I left the submarine community to go over to PEOIWS to work Aegis, it was six months before folks actually stopped looking at me sideways because you're here from the other camp. <laughs> and what are you doing here? And why are you trying to change us to be more like you all and, and the progressive things that we were doing over in Subs, we were trying to sprinkle into Aegis. But the resistance came immediately from, you didn't grow up here, you're outside of my tribe, and I don't know that I welcome you when we're all there for the same mission and, and for it. Um, so I would, I would look for this organization to let's build some bridges between the tribes and maybe take down some of the walls and gates that exist. But I mean, I know that's ingrained in, in culture for military to some degree, but I think we need to start chipping away at a, at a little bit of that. Over. Thank you, Jimmy. Al, what do you think? What can NOA do for the SES and really for the GS community? Of, I, I think that one just understanding the plight of, of being an SES or being a GS and how that they can add value um, to this organization. Because uh, many times the people who are GSs, there are a lot of people who, who water cloth. And so that is not lost on them. But if you can bring them, give them access um, to the organization, I think they can be value add. I think, you know, in my terms, I'm, I'm somewhat dated because when I went to see, we didn't have internet. We didn't have all of that. This young generation, they have different things that, that, um, that drives them. So how, do, how can we, and I think we have something that be value add that we can add in terms of trying to influence that younger generation because often they, they want to go to, they have different drivers. If they see something they like, they want to go there. And we, at least we have the experience in, in some cases where we can give that advice in terms of if you want to go on the civilian side, here are the things that you're facing, where they may not be able to get that from a, a person that has only been in the military. So from that standpoint, and, and like a simple thing, if I want to get out, I want to apply for a GS position, Understand this here, they, at least in the Coast Guard, and I think other organizations like that, I can't use your salary in the military to set the base pay if you matriculate into um, civilian service. However, if you had an offer from a company, I could use that to set your pay scale. There are so many people I talk to day in and day out does, that do not even understand that that small uh, nuance. So, so little things like that that we can I think add value to. Um, you know, we I mean in the Coast Guard I add value in terms of trying to recruit um, members into the Coast Guard via the C SPY program. I am an executive champion for my school, Savannah State. Um, so, so. We do get out there. We're doing things in different arena arenas to be value add to the to the military service. Over. Thank you, Al and uh, Michelle. Last up, what do you think? In a way, good organization for GSs and SESs to be part of. What can we do better? Oh, certainly. Um, well, first of all, from a um, an HR standpoint, I will say, um, you know, we're we're in this competitive space for talent um, in our military services and in our GS ranks and our SES ranks. And so I think that's, you know, from a NOA perspective, um, I think there's incredible value that comes from um, your members, be they GS, SES, uh, 
uh, flags, um, officers, what have you, in um, helping uh, folks understand the competitive environment that we're in, right? And I think, you know, from my diversity inclusion side, I'll put my, that hat on. I mean, just the partnership that we have within NOA in understanding, you know, challenges to recruiting and retention, um, understanding, you know, concerns from the workforce um, is, is invaluable. And, you know, I think um, that continued collaboration is, is really imperative um, as we have that competitive um, environment for, for talent, because as we know, um, and we can see, you know, from the current census data, the demographics of the United States are, are shifting. And we know that, you know, there, there's even um, those that are eligible to serve, and then you get to those that are propensed to serve. And I mean, it just gets even more competitive, right? So I just think, you know, that the, the um, partnership between NNOA and the sea services is imperative as we continue forward um, in that space. I appreciate it. I really have enjoyed this panel. I think this was, um, I, I love that you, you did this and I think it's a kind of a great first step. It sounds, you know, um, we could have talked more about the, the GS ranks and, and you know, going through that and, and what do you have to do to transition into that? I mean, I think Al raised a great point about just even understanding what, what does it take to become a federal employee if that's what you wanna do? So um, I have thoroughly appreci appreciated being on this panel and um, would, <laughs> hey, look, I'm, I'll sign up for the next one, but would love to have, you know, even more, um, conversation about just be, what does it take to to transition from military service into the federal workforce uh, because it is it's different um, but I um, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, I will pass it back so it's uh, 1932 uh, we have filled the time that was allotted and could go on for some time because as you can see if you look at the chat notes on the side, uh, people all, everybody really got a lot out of this conversation, out of this discussion, out of what you all said, hand clap uh, from our executive vice president, Simonia Blasingham. And, and that cues me to have everybody, please turn on your speaker uh, and give them a hand clap. Use the electronic reactions if you want to, whatever works for you. But thank you. This is a, a fantastic Sorry. conversation. Uh, I, I look forward uh, to working with all of you more. Um, I encourage you to become members like Karen, the life member of NNOA, and to do more inside NNOA because we need it. And I think it, you know, the, the iron sharpens iron, the uh, collaboration, the network is stronger by doing that. So thank you all, and I'll see. Uh, you all tomorrow morning at Coast Guard headquarters for our third day of the 49th annual National Naval Officers Association Leadership and Career Development Symposium. Good night, all. Thank you, and God bless. Hey, sir, before you sign off, I have to, I have to make an, an invitation to all four of them to join our transition assistance team. There you go. You got two thumbs up there. Three, you got three thumbs up there. Four. You got all four thumbs up. There you go. I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Bravo Zulu to the panel. Outstanding. Captain Wright. Thanks, sir. All right. Everyone take care. Be safe.